Today we're going to talk about the concept of white fragility, what it is, how it works, how it's been purported to operationalize itself within our modern American society relative to intersectional culture, and why I think it's absolutely freaking absurd. I recently was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is black about trauma. And this is common for me since I have researched a lot about the concept and people sort of approach me a lot and want to, you know, talk about this thing, you know, field questions, things like that. So he gave me permission to share the details of this conversation on the podcast. We're good friends. So we'll kind of joke about this kind of stuff, but the conversation turned political at one point and I expressed some of my misgivings about intersectionality, politics. And uh, I mean, if you can't tell from any, any of the other videos I've created, I'm a pretty conservative guy. And uh, my concern about uh, intersectionality politics from the perspective of somebody who uh, did his doctoral dissertation on trauma, right? And how trauma really is a misuse of the trauma framework to create arbitrary social hierarchies based on race, ethnicity, and sex, which has polarized American politics. So some of my methodological misgivings about the political and social oper uh, uh, operationalization of that term. He disagreed with me and he proposed that the reason that I took issue with identity politics and with intersectionality was because it threatened my white privilege. This was a suggestion he made to me about me, that the reason I disagreed with him was because I was subconsciously threatened and therefore thereby deployed a defense mechanism, which was my counter argument to him. Okay. And I was compelled to disagree with him because of a psychological defense mechanism, which produced denial of the intersectionality perspective. Now, he was the first to introduce me to this psychological phenomenon, which is unique to whites, I'm learning. Uh, which the political left calls white fragility. So he said, the reason you're disagreeing with me right now or the reason that you don't see things my way is because of your white fragility. White fragility is a psychological mechanism predicated on a certain view about the status of white intellect, the psychiatry of the white mind, and the moral constitution of each white person. So here we will seek to understand better what it is and what might be the appropriate, objective, thoughtful response to this race specific claim about whites. Okay. So we will begin by talking about a particular book. This is a book by sociologist Robin J. D'Angelo. And she writes in her book called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. And she's a white female. And, and D'Angelo writes that white people are so dazzled by their whiteness that their own regular, normative, explicit, and implicit reasons for violence against racial minorities are actually camouflaged to them. So they almost can't even conceive of themselves as racist. But not only are these racist practices camouflaged to whites, but when these practices are brought under the stage light through conversation or reading or cultural messaging, and when they are diagnosed or highlighted and challenged by minority culture, such that white culture's enchantment with its own whiteness is threatened, that they resort to denial tactics, which refortify their enchantment with whiteness and center their own whiteness and recenter their own whiteness as the cultural center and the cultural norm and recast minority ethnicity and culture as, as marginal and exotic. So I'm gonna read a quote from D'Angelo, okay? D'Angelo writes, how can I say that if you are white, your opinions on racism are most likely ignorant when I don't even know you? I can say so because Nothing in mainstream U.S. culture gives us the information we need to have a nuanced understanding of arguably the most complex and enduring social dynamic of the last several hundred years. When we try to talk openly and honestly about race, white fragility quickly emerges as we are so often met with silence, defensiveness, certitude, and other forms of pushback. These are not natural responses. They are social forces that prevent us from attaining the racial knowledge we need to engage more productively, and they function powerfully to hold the racial hierarchy in place." End quote. So notice first that D'Angelo reduces all forms of disagreement with her to epistemological and moral deficiency, okay, to ignorance and selfishness, all right? Epistemology is a word, like many words, and epistemology is the philosophical word for 
how we know, okay? Experience is an epistemology. It's something I know through experience, right? Logic is an epistemology, right? It's something I can use. I can figure out a, a piece of knowledge through deduction, right? Tradition can even be a form of epistemology. But if one is epistemologically blind to a certain object in the world, then they are scientifically handicapped. And for D'Angelo, there is no possible world in which disagreement with her or disagreement with her view about uh, racism and, and the cause for racism and the perpetuation of that racism being white fragility, there is no world in which disagreement with her view could result from an intellectually honest and informed disagreement with her about the issues at hand. It must all be reduced to epistemological and moral self-sabotage by whites. Okay? But first... We must give credit to D'Angelo to D'Angelo for nuancing her view. So, how does she specifically, uh, how does she specify her suggestion about whites in an attempt to fashion a more truthful version of her claim? So, D'Angelo basically argues that three hierarchies exist between white people and racial minorities: epistemological hierarchy, psychological hierarchy, and an ethical hierarchy, in which white people are de facto at the bottom of all of these hierarchies. Okay, so it will be helpful for us to understand the logic by which D'Angelo constructs these hierarchies. So first, D'Angelo argues that the difference between herself and her interlocutors or her, her conversation partners, the difference between her and the people she's talking to who disagree with her, is a matter of information rather than interpretation. So she argues that white people are so socialized by their whiteness that they cannot, without proper racial education and re-education, accurately perceive the extent to which their racist prejudice against minorities is baked into their own worldview. Okay? White people are, in this presentation, philosophically and specularly handicapped by their own race about their own race. Okay, so D'Angelo appeals to her own academic authority as a sociologist to fortify this claim that whites are epistemologically handicapped relative to other races. And it is on this assumption of white philosophical short-sightedness or handicap that programs such as racial bias training and implicit bias training have been suggested as cures to perceived racism among whites. And this is how scientists have begun to quantify racial prejudice among whites to give them a test that shows them several dozen black and white images of faces of various races on the screen, right? And classified an ability to distinguish between the faces of participants' own race versus faces of races to, uh, to which the participant did belong, okay? So any extended delay in the participant's ability to distinguish between other race faces was classified as social stereotype and therefore a low score on what they called the affective lexical priming score. So in other words, if you're a few milliseconds slow on distinguishing black faces from one another, you're racist, okay? Now, D'Angelo makes explicit and consistent appeal to this exact research as this, she, so, so, so when she says, um, well, white people, I can, I can say for a fact without knowing uh, a particular white person that they are racist because I just look at general society and I know that there aren't enough researchers out there to inform them about race. And if they only knew, then they would agree with me, right? Which is a whole problem in and of itself. But but let's say that that's the case. What exactly would inform them? It's this sort of implicit bias testing, racial bias testing that she's talking about, okay? So D'Angelo makes explicit and consistent appeal to this exact implicit bias, racial bias research as that about which whites are ignorant, which perpetuates racism. So if you only knew about racial bias training, oh, then you would be an intersectional, then you'd hold the intersectional view. You maybe vote for Hillary, become an intersectionality po politician. Hmm. The psychological science actually is settled that implicit bias scores do not predict discriminatory behavior as demonstrated, for example, in the analysis published in the Journal of Applied Psychology by professors at Texas A&M and the University of Pennsylvania, okay? Okay, implicit bias in these sorts of testing does not produce racist behavior, or sorry, it does not predict racist behavior. It doesn't. The strongest implication of this research is that the data from these implicit bias tests should never be used to judge an individual's beliefs or predict their behavior. 
That is the strongest suggestion these researchers are making. We should not use this data in which one white person is a millisecond short in distinguishing two black faces to say, well, that predicts racist behavior. He needs re-education and then he needs to be able to pass this test, okay? The model simply doesn't predict that behavior, number one. Number two, you can actually train to pass the test. So if you take it a second time, you're actually training to do better the second time, right? So improvement is sort of fabricated, which 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 means that the data which supports the idea that re-education is effective in preventing racism is fabricated as well. And in this recent study, the one I mentioned in the Journal of Applied Psychology, previous left-leaning research which construed the data as correlating with anti-black behavior actually correlates with pro-black behavior. So there was actually a misconstrual of the actual data itself to say something that supported a leftist agenda when the data all along that supported implicit bias was actually misconstrued. It was misinterpreted by data scientists, okay? So that's that's first, that, that D'Angelo argues that the difference between herself and her interlocutors is a matter of information rather than interpretation, which, um, well, we'll get to that in a second. Second, secondly, D'Angelo argues that this intellectual handicap that whites have enables sociologists to diagnose so-called white stress, analogous to post-traumatic stress, okay? So this white stress, which, which this white stress, it reduces all disagreement after the facts about race are on the table to a lack of psychological stamina. So the reason that whites don't agree with D'Angelo or intersectionality politics is because they can't handle the stress of confronting the uh, uh, moral responsibility of their own whiteness, okay? So in other words, not only are whites who disagree with D'Angelo about race epistemologically handicapped, but they are in fact psychologically and psychiatrically handicapped as well. This is, a, this is her second thesis, okay? And she writes in a separate article, so D'Angelo writes in her book, White Fragility, but she actually has another article that she published in the International Journal of Critical Pedagogy, uh, which is a journal about teaching, right, and instruction pedagogy, that the, the problem of racism in America is she calls it, quote, an issue of stamina building, end quote. Okay, so let me read you a quote from her. She says that the problem of racism in America is, quote, it is critical that all white people build the stamina to sustain conscious and explicit engagement with race. She continues, quote, White fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. These behaviors, in turn, function to reinstate white racial equilibrium. So, in this way, D'Angelo construes all forms of disagreement as stress-induced avoidance, which would be a psychiatric explanation of white disagreement with her thesis, okay? So in other words, D'Angelo makes two simultaneous claims. One, whites are peculiarly mentally weak, especially when it comes to race, and two, she's able to make individual psychiatric diagnoses of individual whites by using their race as a proxy for diagnosis. Three, she is licensing anyone who drinks the Kool-Aid of this white privilege concept to extend that diagnosis to individuals with whom uh, they converse who actually happen to disagree with them about this issue of white fragility or race or white privilege or so on and so forth, okay? So the notion that whites are particularly mentally weak despite the fact that one would never survive making these claims about black people in the public sphere, right? So this claim that whites are particularly mentally weak, it is suspicious because one, if true, it supports her larger thesis that white disagreements with intersectionality holds no academic credibility, right? And, and, and two, this claim that white people are particularly mentally weak and the proof is that they disagree, some white people disagree with her about intersectionality. This is unfalsifiable, okay? Because, well, the proof is that you disagree, okay? There, there's no way to measure that psychologically. You're just, you're saying it. It's a, it's a, 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 a what Immanuel Kant would call an analytic concept, okay? It's an a priori. It's an a priori concept, okay? It's something you're just putting on the table and you're saying de facto, it's a, 
the the very conversation as far as you're concerned is predicated on the assumption that you're already right about why I would disagree with you. So, which makes your very claim unfalsifiable, okay? You're actually putting the conclusion, in logical terms, it's a fallacy because you're actually front-loading the conclusion into premise A. And you can't do that, okay? There's no test because of the way that that logical proposition is set up because of the way she defines white pr privilege. There's no, or sorry, by the way she defines white fragility, there's no test which can represent the unconscious mind and draw strong correlatives between those representations and behavior significantly enough to make a credible version of that claim, not only because there's no psychological test we can do it, but, but because philosophically, it's a fallacy. Because philosophically, she has presented it as an unfalsified, categorically unfalsifiable a priori predication on, upon which the conversation is had to begin with. Okay? Which means she cannot be proven wrong by her own definition. Which means that you, and if, you, if you enter into dialogue with D'Angelo about white privilege, you either agree with her or you are wrong on her definitions already. Otherwise, you're not having a conversation because you're mentally weak and you're psychiatrically weak. Okay? So, third... On the basis of this epistemological and psychiatric superiority, which D'Angelo claims that race-informed intellectuals have over white intellectuals who disagree with her, D'Angelo proposes a third deficiency of whiteness that builds on the first two, a moral deficiency, okay? And D'Angelo argues that whites who disagree with her about racial theory are actually culpable for the existence and effects of explicit and implicit racism in American culture. So she argues that in principle, the possibility of a genuine conversation about the facts is impossible since white people are too occluded by their convenient self-blinding weak self-interested disposition and in the mind of the leftist there is the framework for all conversations about race between a leftist and a white person the white person is intellectually and psychologically and psychiatrically and ethically inferior and must begin every conversation about the topic by repenting of their whiteness. Now, we ought to make one observation about the concept of white fragility before we substantively respond. White fragility presupposes the truthfulness of intersectionality politics, okay? White fragility is a trope of intersectionality. And intersectionality politics is a way of construing a, hier a hierarchy of moral obligation within the American populace, in which certain social groups are granted statuses of entitlement or debt based on the number and kind of traumas that they've experienced, okay? And these groups, measured along the lines of victimhood, see whites as having the greatest amount of cultural debt and the smallest amount of cultural entitlement, which is why you will rarely hear of concepts like black fragility and female fragility, okay? Intersectionality, which views individuals primarily through their ethnic group lens relative to the majority culture in which they reside, has historically been critiqued as a very white idea. Okay, So in other words, the people who are most electrified by this idea of intersectionality and those who have shaped it are young, white, social justice-oriented progressives who are politically enthused. Those are the people who have produ produced this idea, okay? And it is important to make this observation so that we can take issue with the notion that American social groups are truly divided along intersectional lines, which I, I don't think they are. And, and, and there is this notion that um, the American social groups actually function according to intersectionality categories, which sees people primarily in terms of their race or sex rather than their individuality or rather than based on other traumas or other group categories like religion or abuse. Okay, and or inter intersectionality versus non-intersectionality or intersectionalists versus non-intersectionalists is not black versus white. It's a left versus right issue. Okay, and consequently, here are my responses to the white fragility concept. Okay, first, the reason white fragility is an evil concept is that it is racist. It makes a race-specific generalization about the intellect, psychiatry, and morality of an entire ethnic group. And those who operationalize the concept of white fragility implicitly affirm the legitimacy of stereotyping white individuals as representative of an inferior ethnic class and consequently of denying them a voice in the conversation. And I don't, I don't care about winning the intersectionality Olympics. Okay, I don't care about whether or not uh, 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 white fragility is actually racist on their own terms. 
Okay, these people have already construed their world of political discourse as one in which the most important consideration is the war of intersectional identities or the the intersectionality Olympics or the victim Olympics, right? Rather than the war of ideas. I'm not interested in winning intersectionality cards. I'm not interested in accumulating the victimhood identities. I'm not. Politics ought to be a war of ideas and policy ought to be a war of implementing the best possible ideas into policy, okay? Politics ought to seek to, uh, seek to elevate the dignity of every single individual and not silence an entire race based on an imaginary psychiatric condition with no scientific uh, evidence in order to assure equality of outcome, which is an absurd goal, absurd goal. Second, those who operationalize the term white fragility signify a staunch unwillingness to engage in conversation whatsoever. Okay, so to the degree that my intellectual disagreement about politics is reduced by my interlocutors to some intellectual or psychiatric or moral handicap to which I have no specular access, there can be no conversation. Okay, the political conversation becomes one in which whites not only can't speak, but shouldn't speak. And this has manifested itself in a conversation or in conversations as an impulse to silence whites politically. Okay, now I'm, you probably think, listen, listen, I'm kind of kind of bald, you know, I kind of look like a skinhead. Like, wh where's this guy going, right? Like, listen, I'm I'm not about to go on some like white rights pro pro white rant. I'm not. Okay, I'm just wanting, <laughs> I'm just wanting a conservative individual based approach where we could talk to each other person to person, face to face. Okay, I was having a conversation with a, a black colleague of mine when I taught at Moody Bible Institute, when I taught philosophy at Moody, and I asked my colleague, I said, How, you know, and it was like 2016, I think, a lot of these issues were just bubbling up, and I think it was 2017, so Trump had been elected, and I asked him, you know, how, how should I engage in dialogue about this issue of race, which was still, the conversation with surrounding race was still sort of a maturing conversation, and his answer to me, uh, you know, his white colleague uh, asking, how should I engage in conversation about this? We're, and we're two academics, by the way, right? And he says to me, just listen. That's all. Don't speak. And this is, of course, an absurd suggestion. I'm not going to take this person's suggestion, okay? That's not dialogue. That's a lecture. That's submission. It's intellectual jihad, okay? It's pure submission and subjection. What happens if I do listen? And I still disagree. That's where white fragility becomes so helpful because after you're presented with all the data and you still refuse to become a leftist, they have a word for your condition. That's diagnosable. White fragility. Welcome. Okay? The inability to cope with threats to your white privilege. Here's your diagnosis. Go to the racial bias re-education seminar so you can score better on your racial bias exam. Right? It's ridiculous. Third. And following on this point about threats, right? Because I think this language of threats is really interesting in the way that it plays in intersectionality politics, okay? It is important to understand the double talk of leftism on this point in this language of threat, okay? Because they'll say, oh, whites are so scared. Of, they're threatened about losing their, they have a, they, they, they're, they're triggered into, by their white, they're triggered by threats to their privilege and they can't handle the, the, the white stress of losing that privilege, right? So, Leftists insist on seeing every political position as a power grab, okay? This is a typically postmodern approach to politics, one in which all of speech is considered as an uh, is conceived as an act of power, and therefore every act of speech is conceived as either an act of justice or as an act of violence, okay? So for postmodern philosophers like Michel Foucault, every speech act is conceived as either punishment or exaltation or vindication, right? For Jacques Derrida, all speech is creation or destruction. For Jean-Paul Sartre, all, all speech mitigates scarcity and abundance, and therefore all speech either deprives or enriches personal capital, creating a balance or imbalance, tipping the scales of equity one way or another. All speech is culpable for something, right? So... It is natural for intersection that that's a postmodern way of seeing it, right? So it is natural for intersectionality to construe white pathology that they invent as obsessed with a threat because that's their language, okay? That's the language they use that they reach for, and it fits too well, okay? This language it almost fits too well with tropes of common Marxist tales about the cultural bourgeois. Okay, so but the surprising irony of the leftist suggestion that all whites are like triggered by threats to their cultural privilege is that the function of the term white fragility actually does threaten common cultural privileges in a way that is targeted specifically at whites. <laughs> 
Okay? So the implication of the concept of white fragility is that the only way to overcome one's white fragility is to drink the intersectionality Kool-Aid and to submit to the cultural demands of those lording the martyrdom of minority status as an epistemological advantage, as a specular advantage over whites in particular. And they invent the myth of the threat to white privilege so that they can target common privileges among whites specifically, and then they get to decry any, any identification of this agenda as, as a real threat, saying, hey, you're, you're, you're targeting common privileges among whites in particular through this concept of white or through this concept of white fragility, right? And then they'll say, oh, no, 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 that's just paranoia. That's, that's just your white fragility too. Even when they openly practice these postmodern politics of speech as violence, of everything as threat, of throwing around this category of this absurd category of microaggressions everywhere, Ooh, it's microaggression, right? And then when a white person starts talking about, well, actually, you are sort of threatening privileges when you actually are moving towards the place where you're threatening policies which 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 have compelled speech, not only compelled speech, but you're actually telling me to just shut up and just listen. You actually are starting to threaten my ability to speak. Oh, you're just being paranoid. You're just being fragile. But then they get triggered, right? So there's a double speak there among leftism. Fourth, identity politics has occasioned some of the most heinous violence in history, okay? So most white people who disagree with leftist politics do so on the basis of principles, which are neither racist nor psychotic, okay? Identity poli politics and I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to go into the uh, uh, my enemy is Hitler land, but I, I just it, there's too much, uh, there's too close of a resonance here, okay? Identity, politi uh, identity politics are, a, are literally what got us to the Holocaust, right? <laughs> Here's my point, and if you disagree with me, you're literally Hitler. Okay, I'm, I'm actually sort of, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is there's an ideological resonance, okay? I'm not actually saying leftists are Hitlerian or Nazis, I'm, I'm not. What I'm saying is the hermeneutic is the same. The, cons the, conceptual, the conceptual schema with regards to race is what uh, uh, is, is the same, okay? And let me explain that. We have allowed ourselves to indulge in an ethical position with intersectionality politics and identity politics, which encourages the corporate culpability of a single ethnicity for the ills of another ethnicity. Jews were not culpable for Germany's economic failing even if they were the holocaust still wouldn't have been justified right but like the, it, germany was able to point at jews and say guilty you cannot have a hermeneutic which allows you to do that you cannot have an ethical or philosophical category which allows you to do that okay identity politics is what allowed the jews to become a target of cultural spite in germany okay this is in fact one of Hitler's primary arguments in Mein Kampf. If you read Mein Kampf, it's a disturbing book, but you see it everywhere. There's rantings of a, of a, of a loon. But, but Hitler argues that the most important thing you need to know about a Jew is that he's a Jew. And no matter what he says, no matter what he does, he's not a trustworthy person. And he will always, everywhere, place his Zionistic Jew, ag Jew agenda above the well-being of his Ger Gentile neighbor, above the welfare of Germany, and would prioritize the expediency of the advancement of Judaism over against the general good of mankind. Okay, that was Hitler's point. Because for Hitler, the Jewish self-interest was irrevocable from the Jew. And it required re-education, and everybody needed to know about it and practice it, and practice a prejudice toward it. Because there's a special Jewish privilege and a Jewish self-interest that needed to be overcome. And for Hitler, the Jewish self-interest was socially hardwired into every Jew, and it required a social and political uh, penance by each member of the race. In that regard, D'Angelo's book reads line for line like a modern version of Mein Kampf. Okay, but applied to white people. Even the author's hatred for white people feels very similar to Hitler's sort of putrid and palpable disdain for Jews. Okay, the argument is the same. And as soon as your ethical model allows you to hold a certain race responsible for the ills of society, and then you treat that race differently, right? And even culturally or informally, well, now they don't have as many rights in a conversation. They can't speak as much. They couldn't possibly ever understand because of their ethical and epistemological and psychiatric handicap. As long as you start saying that, that our race deserves to be silenced or re-educated, you have gone too far. Too far. Your ideas have become evil. Your ideas no longer hold a legitimate seat at the table of ideas.
Okay. A recent study in the International Journal of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education argues that instructors ought to cultivate in their white students a sense of guilt and blameworthiness for their whiteness. One of the questions asked of the students was whether they believed they practiced racial discrimination. And if they denied that they participated in this practice, this was classified as racial antipathy. So if they didn't have a white guilt, explicit white guilt, a sense of blameworthiness for being white. They were labeled as racist. This is too far. And an inability to recognize this as abusive and inappropriate can no longer see that its ideology is spiteful and destructive for a society to adopt, not even to mention less than Christian. Okay? The white fragility concept is deeply morally objectionable. And this concept is becoming a tool for great evil because it is racist about the white intellect. It is harmfully unscientific in its psychiatric overgeneralizations about white Americans and overreaching applications for white individuals and its licensing of people who have race, racial conversations to diagnose white people with white fragility. Absolutely unscientific and ridiculous and, uh, and absurd. Preposterous. And it perpetuates racial polarization in America by silencing white voices on the basis of, of a conception of moral inferiority based on a weak white constitution. And for these three reasons, the concept of white fragility, as it has become popularly operationalized by leftists in modern political discourse, is evil. And the concept of white fragility conflicts with basic Christian principles of charity and human dignity. Okay? One recent book published by IVP Academic even entertains the question, can white people be saved? Okay, that's actually the name of the book. And in this book, it's a compilation of authors taken from a conference. One author argues that the task of Christianity is, quote, in this new century to overturn white subjectivity in all its modalities, end quote. This is hypocritical in that such a label toward other races would be forbidden and, and should be forbidden, okay? No, it would be immoral to publish a book called Can Black People Be Saved? That would be immoral. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous question. No Christian should entertain that question. It's, just, and it's, it's an absurd inquiry. And it is immoral because the practice of denigrating individuals on the basis of a view of their racial inferiority is wrong and unchristian and hysteric and politically idolatrous and irrational and bullying and inconsistent and incoherent and vile. And we, listen, <laughs> I, all we can do is conclude, okay? So, so <laughs> I mean, I could, I could go on forever, but, but, but I've sort of made my point. I've reviewed this book. I've made re the responses to this book which are that it is immoral and unscientific and overreaching and hypocritical and self-destructive. But we'll include now with, with, with a case study of white fragility in practice. So in a recent debate between Jordan Peterson and Michael Dyson, Peterson admitted that, that the right, right, so, so the political right, could go too far ideologically. And the right would go too far ideologically when they become racist, right? So Nazism is an example of right-wing ideology gone too far. And so he asked Michael Dyson, what would signify ideologically that the left had gone too far? And this was Dyson's response to Peterson. Dyson, uh, Dyson said this to Peterson, quote, Why the rage, bruh? You're doing well, but you're a mean, mad white man. <laughs> End quote. That's how white fragility is operationalized today. And it's evil. And this is the current state of our political discourse. And we need to do better than the concept of white fragility. Decent people who enter into political dialogue in good faith are morally obligated not to seriously operationalize this term against whites. It's absurd and we need to do better. And as Christians especially, we are obligated not to use this concept in a positive way.